organisms are able to tolerate extremes in their habitats with other kinds of plasticity, like changing their behaviors. Plants, for example, only grow where they can tolerate conditions where they're rooted in the ground. If they can't tolerate them, they die. Animals, however, can move around and they are much more likely to display behavioral plasticity. In many animals, you might find different stages of their life on, in different locations, an extreme being caterpillars of plants eating leaves, butterflies flying around visiting flowers for nectar. But even in animals that are pretty similar throughout their lives, they can change their behavior. This little cactus wren, for example, lives in Mexico in the southwestern U.S., and over the course of a day, you'll find cactus wrens in different places, different microhabitats. In occupying different parts of their habitat at different times of the day, the wrens optimize their activity budgets and reduce their thermal stress. If you look at this picture on the right, thermal stress decreases from microhabitats A through E. A being the most exposed and open, B, C, D, and E being more and more covered up. And if you look in the diagram at the left, it, dia it portrays the amount of time the wrens are observed to be in each habitat. Early in the morning, 7 a.m., the sun is just coming up, it's quite cool, you find them distributed all over the place, especially on the tops of the bushes. 8 a.m., 9 a.m., things are warming up, and the temperatures of the more exposed microhabitats, you can see temperatures across the bottom, are getting hotter and hotter. And so during the hottest times of the day, 11.30 a.m. and 2.30 p.m., B, which is um, excuse me, E, the tall light blue bar, they spend the most of their time in the middle of the biggest bushes. And these little wrens make their nests in which they place a couple of eggs oriented in different directions depending on the time of the year. In the spring, when it's still kind of cool, the mouth of the nest is oriented away from the winds. In the summer, it faces the breeze to receive the cooling benefits of that breeze. And nests that are oriented in the right direction rear more young. So this is a very basic sort of natural selection because if the orientation is not appropriate to the time of year, the eggs will cook rather than develop a little bird. If the environmental conditions are so extreme or adverse as to prevent normal functioning of the organisms, if they can't adapt or if the adaptations would be too costly, there are some extreme measures animals take. They can migrate. They may store. These alternative survival strategies include migration, storage, and dormancy. If organisms move to another region where conditions are more favorable, we call that migration. And some migrations are truly remarkable in the distance. Arctic terns migrate from the Arctic, where they spend their summers, to the other summer in the Antarctic, six months different, 30,000 kilometers from pole to pole. And monarch butterflies are well known for their seasonal migrations from Mexico in the southern U.S. north into southern Canada. Locusts also show behavioral plasticity, but it's more of a developmental response. At high population densities, they become migratory rather than staying in the same place. And hoofed animals in Africa, the ungulates, 
follow the rainfall and the production of fresh vegetation in Africa. This figure shows movements of wildebeest in the Serengeti between Kenya and Tanzania and eastern Africa. Through the months of the year, the, cons the densities are shown with the larger green dots moves as the rainy patterns, the rain patterns change and shift through the seasons. Organisms that can't move, their strategy is very likely to be to store their energy, keeping their accumulated resources for use in the future when things are better or when things are worse because desert cacti store water during the rainy periods when there is abundance of water and keep it for use for their slower growth in the future. In places without much nutrients in the soil, plants may store nutrients to use later. And animals also store energy as fat for periods of severe weather during the winter. Certain mammals and some birds hide supplies of extra food caching. When an oak tree makes tons of acorns or any other plant produces seeds in abundance, squirrels and chipmunks might collect many more seeds than they can eat. They bury many of them for later recovery. Agoutis in the rainforest act in much in the same way. But the benefit to the plant is that lots of those seeds are never rediscovered. Sometimes the animals may find them and have a future food supply when things are scarce, but if not, the seeds germinate. And the last extreme strategy is to become dormant. Plants show this response when they lose their leaves in the winter or when it's very dry and wait for warm weather or rains to leaf out again. Some mammals may hibernate. Some insects enter diapause, where they lower their freezing point and metabolic rate to survive freezing conditions. Sometimes insects may do this in the summer when it's very dry, so they um, <clears throat> don't dry out completely. And, of course, many propagules of plants seeds and spores and also spores of bacteria and fungi exhibit dormancy mechanisms letting them persist sometimes for years till conditions are right for their germination and growth. This little dormouse is hibernating for the winter and he's even provisioned his hibernaculum, his little nest, with a supply of hazelnuts for when he wakes up and is hungry. And hawk moths, svinged moths, in the family Svingidae, show dormancy too. They may have a long stage pupating in the chrysalis underground, but at when the time is right, the adults emerge from the ground, feed from flowers, mate, and lay their eggs on host plants. The larvae feed while the plants are growing, and then they drop from the plant and pupate in the soil underground, and they may stay that way for quite a while. 